episode of Preservation Perspectives, ACHP Chairman Amy Giorgiani speaks with Mimi Miller, Executive Director Emerita of Historic Natchez Foundation in Natchez, Mississippi, about the role of African Americans in the history of Natchez and the historic places to visit relating to that history. Now, Chairman Giorgiani. being with us today. Um, Mimi Miller is the Executive Director uh, Emerita of the Historic Natchez Foundation and Natchez, Mississippi. Uh, can you, um, uh, you've got you know, just extensive experience in historic preservation. Can you tell us a little bit more about your background? Yes, I can. I came along at a time, I finished college in 1966, the same year the Preservation Act was enacted and there really were no programs for historic preservation at all. So most people my age got into the field through back doors. Some of them were art history majors or or other fields. And I was an English major. And my husband and I were married when he went back to college and got a degree in art history. And then he went to the winter tour program um, in It's a program that is partnered with the University of Delaware and it's a material culture master's degree that's well known. And I learned a lot from those two years he spent there because I worked for the program and helped some in the museum. And my training in historic preservation is all by osmosis. It's what I got from him and what I got from those experiences affiliated with his graduate program. We moved to Natchez, Mississippi in 1973 in January. I'd never been to Mississippi before we arrived earlier in the summer to Jackson, where he took a job as um, really the first architectural historian with the state. And I was shocked that we moved to Mississippi. Um, I could tell he was leaning in that direction because he thought the East Coast had been done to death and he thought there were a lot of things in Mississippi, surely, that people didn't know about. And I never dreamed we would still be here this many years later, but they've been great years. And Natchez has been a just a, a great laboratory for, for what I love to do. I ended up becoming a historic preservation professional and I owe my career to the Mississippi Department of Archives and History. They had a good bit of grant money to give away in the mid seventies. And you had to be on the national register in order to get the grant money. And they didn't have the staff and the time to go around the state listing. So one of them called me and said, I'm convinced, you know, we really need this done. You know, you could write these nominations because you have Ron to help you. And that's how my career launched. And So for many years, I focused primarily on national register work, individual buildings and districts. Um, The tax credits came along too in 1976 and we did the first historic preservation tax credit application in Mississippi. And that's how I got into historic preservation and have been in it ever since. And it's a fascinating field. I, I am not a past worshiper. And I explain that to people. What the past means to me is what it means for today and tomorrow. And um, and it's very important for the future of Natchez. It's the thing, it's the cornerstone of its economy always. Um, Industries may come and industries may go. Oil and gas prices, we have an oil and gas industry, um, go high and go low. But here's the cornerstone, the historic buildings are always there for us. And since 1932, well, even before that, they've been economically important. Even when they weren't being opened as tour houses and things in the late 19th century, the city was advertising them in promotional materials that they sent out to businesses and things like that and and promoted the city. And they they would illustrate those with pictures of, of great buildings. So in a sense, they were taking advantage of that even that far ago. Tell me about some of the, um, uh, the historic resource studies that you did um, while working with the you know, Historic Nat- Natchez Foundation. And uh, you know, particularly, I understand there's, um, you've included a study in African-American history. Yes. Um, 
I was primarily a consultant affiliated with the Historic Natchez Foundation from when the office opened in 1979, off and on until about 1989. And I went to work with the Mississippi Department of Archives and History to run their certified local government program, which is a public you know, partnership between the National Park Service, State Historic Preservation Offices and local governments. And that was a great experience for three years trying to get preservation ordinances passed in the state. And then in 1992, my husband was traveling a lot with the reproduction licensing program we had initiated to generate money for preservation. And the board suggested they hire me and bring me home um, and let me be in the office and take over the preservation aspects. So that's when I really started working in earnest, um, not looking so much for consulting jobs, of which I have had a lot and learned a lot from, but doing things like contractual work with the National Park Service through the Historic Natchez Foundation. And I think one of the most valuable things I did for the foundation and for me personally um, was the historic resource study. I wrote basically the history of Natchez and, and Melrose and the William Johnson House. They're wow. two of their major properties. Um, and these historic resource studies are meant to guide Park Service employees and superintendents who come to a place and need to know what makes it important. So it was great for me to have a document, a footnoted document that I worked several years on that I have, I go back in it periodically and I update it. Oh. Um, it was finished in the mid 1990s. And so I've tried to keep it current and expand upon it when I have the opportunity. I also, I did the historic structures reports, the part that are called the developmental histories. And it was through those reports that I worked on the history of Melrose and the William Johnson House. And those studies too, I have updated those over time as we've learned other things. They were invaluable, not only for what I learned about those two properties for the park and, and for the town, but also for the ways those properties could help us interpret other properties. What we know about Melrose and particularly African enslavement at Melrose and even, at, as a matter of fact, post-Civil War servitude at Melrose mm -hmm. have, have played an important role interpreting those, those history themes at other historic sites, because we can take the suburban Villa Melrose, which was not a plantation. So it's very difficult interpreting slavery at somewhere where the slaves lived in buildings that had lap siding, plastered walls, tongue and groove boards, glazed sash windows, et cetera. It's very different from plantation enslavement at a remote plantation where buildings have exposed front blank floors rather than tongue and groove, batten shutters on windows rather than glazed sash. And so it was the challenge of telling the story of slavery at Melrose, but also, and it's the challenge for the Park Service, but making sure as you tell it, that people understand that not all slaves live like that, mm -hmm. or enslaved yeah. people. You, you just, you could give a fa false impression of the conditions. Mm -hmm. And yet Natchez had lots of these suburban villas as they were called, you know, places where you were within a mile or four miles of maybe downtown Natchez, but you had this sublime location that was quiet. You didn't have the street noise, the smells, the constant smoke since people cooked in the summer over the fires. And um, you can imagine the joy of getting there. It was sort of based on the English landed gentry, mm -hmm. uh, the suburban villa concept was. Mm -hmm. And Natchez was particularly well known for it in the South. So what people often interpret as plantation houses are not. Mm -hmm. They are suburban villas. Huh. Uh, can, can you tell um, us the role um, that African Americans played in the history of Natchez? They played a major role in the history of Natchez. We were predominantly African American, you know, for most of our early history. It was just in the later years, particularly in the 20th century after the Northern Migration, that we're now probably about 56% African American. Um, it's the dominant. Um, population, but not to the extent that it was in the past. Natchez is generally considered by historians and it is studied 
tremendously for African-American history, pre-Civil War, pro-Civil War, um, and now most recently civil rights. But one historian, Michael Wayne, who um, from University of Toronto and Yale, um, Michael wants to describe Natchez basically as the, the, just the epitome of the Deep South and nowhere um, in the South was there an economy so strongly identified and based on African enslavement and cotton. And it was in many ways the symbolic capital of the Deep South Cotton Kingdom. It was so early settled in 1716 compared to many other places. There was this long established history with African Americans. I am sure that the French, when they came in 1716, probably had possibly a few enslaved African Americans with them already. And then the great arrival happened in 1719. And that, that really started the tremendous growth of, of African enslavement. Um, and of course, the second major event was the cotton gin, which was invented here, which was invented in 1793, I guess. And we had our first one in 1795. That was the second thing. All of a sudden, you had a way to, you know, to take a, an agricultural product and make it much more profitable to grow lots and lots and lots of it that needed lots and lots more of enslaved people. So two events, the French settlement and the cotton gin played a, a, a big role. The other one was the agricultural economy changing on the East Coast to the point that a lot of by, let's see, by the 1830s, two thirds of the African Americans that were enslaved in Natchez were actually born in Virginia. Huh. And that became the great exporter state of enslaved people to Mississippi. Um, so that was an important point in time too. Kentucky, Virginia, I mean, all of the Southern East Coast were importing slaves. Mm. That was one of their most profitable businesses. So we have, there's so many different African-American stories of enslavement you can tell from the African-Americans who were once enslaved and freed. We had a large, fascinating free black population. Then there's also the town enslaved people who led much freer lives in many ways. Everybody knew everybody, you know, they clerked in stores and, and many of them had relatively important jobs. And the next year were the suburban villa and then there were the masses on the plantations who knew nothing but that in many cases, they were very isolated. The plantations sur surrounding Natchez, they had some contact with town and knew what was involved with it because they could come in on Sundays and sell things that they had grown or made themselves. But in some of the really rural counties in Mississippi or the parishes in Louisiana, and basically the, many of the river parishes in Louisiana across from Natchez were nothing but planting provinces for Natchez. The land was flat, it didn't erode, unlike the lowest soil of Natchez, which eroded and there was not contour planting, you know, that early that the Natchez planters began speculating on the flatlands in Louisiana and buying it up. And that was the center of really the most profitable of their cotton economy. But they also owned land as far away as East Texas in Arkansas. Mm. They just kept expanding and Natchez was geographically in the center of the world's richest cotton growing lands. Wow. Louisiana and Texas stretch to the west and Mississippi, Natchez is on the Louisiana Mississippi border and it stretched to the east across the Mississippi into Alabama and upriver. And so if people are studying African enslavement, they're ultimately gonna study at Natchez. The record survived, we never had a courthouse fire. Um, it, it's a fascinating history. Wow. But so there's a fascinating after the war, I will assure you. Oh, yeah. Yeah, anything uh, on leading or in regards to that, um, any other uh, noteworthy moments post-Civil War 
First of all, the second largest slave market in the deep south was in Natchez. And it was referred to as the Forks of the Road because it was located in an area that had long been known as the Forks of the Road that straddled the city limits. And as ordinances began to push the traders out of the city limits, they sort of congregated there. It was actually on a road that was the terminus of the Natchez Trace and a major land entry into Natchez. Uh, and so when this town was occupied during the Civil War, and I think this is a, an, an important thing to note. First of all, Natchez voted against secession, which just blows people away. Why did a place with the richest cotton planters in the world vote against secession? They were also educated at Ivy League schools. They were well-traveled, and they knew that it was absolutely the craziest idea that anybody could ever have, um, and they were proved right about that. But one of the first things that happened with the African-American community during the Civil War, of course, they fled to town, you know, seeking freedom, which wasn't always a pretty picture when they got to town, but they joined um, African-American men, joined and became part of the U.S. colored troops. And not long after the occupation in July, 1863, they were given an assignment to tear down the forks of the road, slave markets, and to use the materials to build barracks and, and other buildings. And so there's an account written by a soldier and published in the Milwaukee Sentinel where he talks about the order was given at the end of the day and they started tearing it down and they didn't stop and were still tearing it down at daybreak. And as they tore it down, they were telling the stories of the horrible things that they had experienced or family members had experienced at that site. So that's one of the most moving stories, I think, and represents a transition from an enslaved African-American society to a free one. Mm -hmm. They got to tear down the forks of the road. Wow. I understand uh, your organization has been the recipient of a few um, National Park Service grants through the Historic Preservation Fund um, related to underrepresented communities. Can you tell us a little bit more about the, those grants and the projects? And congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. The underrepresented communities, the grant actually went to the Mississippi Department of Archives and History, and they have contracted with us for that particular project. So. That's our outbuilding survey. We've been undertaking the outbuilding survey outside the grant before the grant came. And the grant will enable us to do a multiple resource national register nomination of all these buildings. So, and it's Southwest Mississippi. We've expanded beyond Natchez and Adams County to include the whole Southwest sex, section of the state. Um, our other civil rights grant is a grant basically to create a multiple resource national register nomination of civil rights sites. Um, those include things like churches where rallies were held and um, marches began. They include sites of bombings. They include the historic house, for example, that was owned by our Lebanese mayor during the civil rights movement that was bombed um, and survived. He wasn't so lucky with a large shopping complex that was destroyed by the Ku Klux Klan. Um, so we're looking at all of these different resources and creating a multiple resource. And we're revising some old national register districts that were done in the 1970s up to the 1990s to recognize the civil rights significance of the properties within those districts. So we'll have individual buildings, we'll have sites, and uh, we'll have rewritten districts all into a multiple resource. And then we'll also do a guidebook and a map so that people can visit the sites. Um, I understand there's a, a Natchez National Cemetery, uh, which is still in use yeah. today. Mm -hmm. um, it's the final resting place of, of many Blacks who, who fought in the Civil War. Um, why was the cemetery created? And, and can you, if you could tell us who's, who's buried there. Yes, it was created in 1866, and it was originally a very small one, only 11 acres. It has mm -hmm. grown some since then. It's still not tremendously large. And some national cemeteries um, are under Park Service jurisdiction. Others are under the Veterans Administration, and ours is the Veterans Administration. It was sort of established, I think, to actually rebury casualties who were buried elsewhere. And they were put in temporary graves and union dead and moved to the cemetery. Over time, of course, it, it 
It was the great burial ground for the veterans of the US Colored Troops. White Southerners had an aversion to national cemeteries for many years as one of those other stains on the past um, associated with prejudice. And they weren't buried there. And so it became predominantly an African-American cemetery until the Spanish-American War and particularly World War I. And now there is no segregation anymore and, and whites are, are buried there routinely. But that was not the case initially. And I was just reading something not long ago and I hadn't really thought about it, how important the Spanish-American War was, maybe not our highest moral moment in history, but what it did was made us one country again as Southerners went off to fight with Northerners. And I think it played a role in integrating the National Cemetery as well. Just overall in your efforts, can you explain um, the importance of preserving these sites that are important to the history of African-Americans? Um, you've worked on a wide range of projects, um, but particularly um, in this context. Yes, um, people are better able to understand history if they have something to touch. When we first started working hard on African-American history at the Historic Natchez Foundation, when the office opened in 1979, one of our focuses was, primary focus was to identify sites that were African-American history sites, things that we could create tours from, slide lectures from, things that people could touch and see. And I think if you don't have those touchstones, it's much harder to really understand the past and to appreciate it. And there is such pride in these buildings today. Natchez had a very affluent African-American post-Civil War class of people that were remarked upon in numerous national publications. We produced a great number of doctors, attorneys, uh, professional people that were born after the Civil War and that moved and made great contributions to other cities. Um, segregation, unfortunately, was a great brain drain for the South because so many people left. And, and I can say now we're seeing some of them come back, some of their descendants or grandchildren who grew up with grandparents in the summer. Um, we're seeing a little bit of a reverse movement, but it's very, if you don't preserve a slave cabin, for example. And I want to commend Joe McGill with the Slave Cabin Project. He goes around the country sleeping in them. It was a program he started with the National Trust to bring attention and we've lost so many of them. But to understand the past, you have to see those buildings. You have to understand exactly what it was like to live at that particular point in time. And if you don't have the real thing, something created is never the same. And so, we're very lucky we probably have the largest collection of pre-Civil War dependency buildings in the United States. And those buildings obviously were most dated with African-Americans. And the foundation now is working on a project with the Mississippi Department of Archives and History and the National Park Service to survey every one of those buildings in Natchez and Adams County, draw them, record them, photograph them. And we're excited about that project too. Wow, that's um, really, really incredible. Thank you so much for sharing um, all of this. I have not made my way down <laughs> to Mississippi in quite some time um, and uh, look forward to, um, to, to seeing this more in person. Um, um, wow, yeah, thank you. Um, and just for your, um, you know, your understanding of preserving these places and why it is so indeed important to have something physical and there and and what it does to assist in telling um, America's full story. Um, so thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for asking us to join you today. We love to talk about Natchez and its history. Wonderful. All right. Thank you so much, Mimi.